you know, agricultural technology is, is, a, is a topic that 3IA works on, IFP works on, uh, many of our colleagues in India and elsewhere work on. We know that technology adoption has been shown in the past to lead to improvements in productivity, income, welfare, food security, and more generally, uh, agricultural development and economic growth. India is, is, you know, one of the poster childs for that, for that relationship. But technology adoption itself is, a, is a, a tricky subject, especially in the context of smallholder agriculture. There's a rich body of work on this dating back 30, 40 years now, and we know a lot about the constraints to adoption. Uh, there's, a lot known, uh, there's a lot known about readily measurable constraints, such as the biophysical characteristics of land, soil, water, and biology, farm characteristics like farm size, scale, or the farming system, individual characteristics of the farmer like experience or age, education, um, or household labor supply at that household level, market factors, uh, institutional factors such as land tenure arrangement, and of course the returns to adoption, net returns and variability in returns. Um, and we're learning a lot more in the, in the past 15, 20 years about things like um, information asymm asymmetries and information constraints, uh, the issues related to experimentation and trialing that farmers conduct to understand a new technology, exposure and awareness, Learning by doing, learning from others and peer effects, uh, and learning by noticing, among other things. And more recently, there's been a, a, an increasing body of work around individual preferences and beliefs, things like risk, ambiguity, loss, uh, and time preferences. Surprisingly, I think we have a fairly limited toolkit with which to, to address some of these constraints when it comes to understanding technology adoption. What do we use? Basically, we provide farmers with credit, we subsidize farmers to adopt these technologies, especially in India, or we use extension services to reduce risk or address uh, asymmetric information problems. Most of the time, um, it's the public sector that, that designs and promotes these solutions, not so much the private sector. Um, so this, this study was, was born out of that context, saying, well, how can you bring the private sector into the uh, development and the promotion of a new technology that farmers are unfamiliar with, that may be risky to farmers, that farmers may not have much information about, um, and, and how can the private sector maybe working with the public sector or uh, looking at particular niches or market segments, uh, can they get into that kind of business? Um, so our study looks at three dimensions of this in, in the context of a field experiment. First, we look, to, we look at the, uh, the returns to adoption about a particular technology that I'm going to explain shortly. We look at alternative uses of a public subsidy regime, um, and we look at the role of peer effects in technology adoption. So let me start with the technology, because that's always the fun part. Um, the context in India, I think everybody is very clear on. Uh, groundwater extraction and depletion is, is one of the pressing issues when it comes to the agricultural sector. In Punjab, Haryana, Delhi, of course, Rajasthan, you see these, these uh, massive levels of water extraction that are, that are beyond sustainable levels by, by any measure. Um, our study context is in UP uh, along the border of Bihar where groundwater extraction is not at present so much of an issue and where some areas are in fact flood prone. However, looking to the future you would expect with greater intensification of agriculture and non-agricultural uses, groundwater extraction could become uh, a serious issue. I think there's no, there's no controversy there. Um, so one of the solutions put forward by, by our, our agronom agronomist friends is conservation agriculture, which is sort of a class of technologies um, that's designed to reduce, uh, to reduce extraction of water from the, uh, from the water table, from the aquifer, uh, by ensuring that there's always sort of a cover of soil on the land, uh, a cover of crops or soil or residues on the land, um, and ensuring that nutrients and water remain in the soil. It's, it's one of several technologies that have been explored uh, to address this problem of groundwater extraction. Uh, the public benefits are quite obvious, less pressure on the aquifer, uh, less fossil fuels used for extracting water with a diesel pump, uh, more sustainable intensification. And the private benefits are generally related to cost savings, cost savings in production. Uh, there are also some benefits associated with yields over time and of course improved soil fertility. So one particular technology is a laser land leveler. I don't know how many of you have ever heard or seen them, but 
uh, in India now, uh, they're, fairly, they're becoming fairly well known in Punjab and Haryana and moving eastwards, less well known but still making some headway. It's often a necessary precursor to the adoption of um, conservation agriculture technologies such as what I described. Uh, and the idea is that it's a standalone technology <coughs> that reduces water usage, improves crop establishment, and increases your cultivable area for a farmer. But adoption of laser land levelers where they haven't been seen before, where farmers are not experienced with them, where farmers may be risk averse, it's a complicated question. And especially where there, are, there may be few service providers, private individuals or small entrepreneurs who buy these units and actually go around farm to farm and level land. I'll explain how it works. Um, first, it gives you more precise leveling. And that's something that farmers generally do, especially in rice cultivation. They flatten their land so you get water establishment uh, that, and, and uh, flood irrigation that's fairly level. Um, it's more precise in traditional leveling practices. Um, and it costs, it costs a fair amount of money. On the other hand, you can regain uh, or recoup those costs uh, just through more efficient or cost-reducing production uh, as a result of its use. Um, in 2011, 2012, when we began this study, the market rate uh, in Punjab and Haryana was about 500 to 600 rupees per hour for custom hired services of a laser land leveler. Um, and that's how most farmers access the, uh, the technology. So ultimately a one acre plot costs about 600 to 1400 rupees to level and that lasts between two and four years depending on how intensive the production is on that land. And that's about, that's a small fraction of total production costs per acre. Um, but where we were working Further east of uh, Punjab and Haryana, uh, the technology was virtually unknown until we came around. So this is how it works. All right? A farmer generally flood irrigates his or her field to the highest point visible. Right? If the field is visible, uh, sorry, if the field has undulations, that means a fairly large volume of water is required to submerge to the highest point. Right? Think of height, length, and depth. Um, and that can also lead to poor crop establishment, water logging, as well as dry spots, um, and lower yields. Traditionally, whether by tractor or earlier by, by bullocks, farmers will, will drag something behind, behind the draft power or the machinery to flatten out the land. And that can get rid of small undulations but not macro undulations on a large field of, of you know, a quarter acre, half acre, or anything with sort of a macro size to it. And that's what happens, for instance, when you don't get rid of those macro undulations. You take, you take care of the small bits of undulation, but not the full. So in come your laser land levelers, all right? It's basically a small operation. Uh, they set up a transmitter a laser transmitter on the corners of the plots. They use that to set out a, a field that instructs a receiver on the, uh, attached to a drag scraper on the back of the tractor that basically runs around the plot several times, lifts and drops soil in accordance with instructions sent from the transmitter so that you get a level field. You get a beautiful level field, a much lower volume of water extracted for flood irrigation purposes, beautiful crop establishment, <laughs> and a good harvest. So the purpose of this uh, project were as follows. First, to understand farmers' demand for leveling and, and the heterogeneity underlying that demand. Second, um, to understand the benefits of leveling for the Indian farmer in our context and how they learn about those benefits. Um, third, to inform business models and to understand how service providers can actually provide these services in a market that's new and where farmers uh, have you know, reticence maybe to adopting. And the fourth point we looked at, were, uh, which is still work in progress, is looking at sort of the, the wider public benefits off-farm you know, in terms of the whole aquifer. Our study area is uh, three districts in Uttar Pradesh. You all know, I think, the statistics in Uttar Pradesh, a very uh, densely populated, poor area, so on and so forth. Um, our sample of, of farmers is as follows. Uh, 
we chose these three representative districts, that is on the eastern side, um, adjacent to uh, both and uh, Bihar. Um, we chose eight villages per district and approximately 20 households per village that were randomly selected. So we have a sample of about 500 households. Um, each household cultivated at least one plot of 20 decimals or, or 0.2 acres. Um, and those are pretty small plots. That's about the, the smallest area that a laser land leveler can, can operate on, can turn around on. And none of these households had been exposed to levelers before, in laser land levelers. Only six had ever heard of it. So basically it's a, you know, it's a tabla rasa. Um, this was the timeline we ran across. Uh, we, we began the study in 2011, continued on into 2012, and we collected um, data, both household data and production data for both the kharif season, the rice season, as well as the rabi wheat season. All of these households were uh, rice wheat system uh, farmers. Um, I'll go through the elements of what we did in this study um, shortly to give you a sense. So the first thing we did was that we provided farmers with a treatment, with information, basically. We said, okay, this is what a laser land leveler is. We don't have the capacity to run around and conduct field demos for everybody. Uh, because that's just logistically very difficult and expensive. We provided an informational um, explanation. It was not promotional. We explained that we were researchers, so on and so forth. And we explained that we were not necessarily promoting the technology for use across the board. We said, listen to the information, figure out if it works for your plot, your household, your income, so on and so forth, then make your decisions. Uh, we provided a, an easy to read visual pamphlet you see on the bottom. We had a video testimony from a progressive farmer from the same area, Bojpuri speaking and, and, and whatnot, who gave a, a, testament, a testimonial about uh, his experience, um, uh, as well as a live farmer who joined us on these information sessions to do the same. Um, and our statements, as I said, were carefully caveated so that we were not uh, promo promoting. And importantly, because we're trying to assess willingness to pay, we didn't really reveal much information about what the price of the custom hire service was. We gave a very general statement about the range of prices that have been um, charged in Punjab, Haryana, where there were uh, laser leveling services, uh, ranging from 500 to 800 over the span of three years, and we left it at that because we wanted to assess their willingness to pay. We conducted a baseline uh, survey fairly standard components, both demographic, production, and uh, other. Um, we used CAPI for this, uh, and it was back in 2011. It was still pretty early in, in the CAPI world. Um, there's Kajal. We conducted an experimental uh, auction and a lottery. It was a Becker de Groot Marshak uh, binding non-competitive auction, for those of you that are familiar with it. Basically, we asked farmers to list out their plots um, that they were interested in having leveled and all of their plots, and said, how much you would, would you pay for this service, plot by plot, right? Um, it's done privately between enumerator and farmer, uh, individually and privately. It's done simultaneously, and it's non-competitive. So it's an auction, but you're not competing against your neighbor. We then conducted a random price draw, and we said, you know, this price is random to the farmers. Uh, anybody who bid at or above this price has an opportunity to receive the service. Anybody who bid below this price won't receive the service, or doesn't have an opportunity to receive the service. So everybody leaves happy, in a sense, from the, from the auction. Um, and, and then after the auction, we took those who had won and separated them into, well, separated them into two groups. We assigned a, a blue chip and a, a red chip and a white chip to them. And then we had a random draw. Anybody who got the red chip was in the lotter won the lottery. They were basically uh, treated. They were the randomized uh, treatment group. Uh, those that didn't but wanted to or were willing to pay for the service did not receive it. They were our control. Um, this is your identification strategy, right? We start with this random sample from um, Village V. Uh, we hold that auction. It's a self-selection process. Those who don't want the leveler opt out. Those who do want the leveler service, stay in. And that's how it looks after self-selection. Then we hold the lottery. From the lottery, which is random assignment, 
We have lottery winners and lottery losers. The lottery winners receive the service, lottery losers don't. So the, in the final sample, we have three groups, and they were roughly equally split by the, um, from among the 500 households we had in our sample. Auction losers who were uh, self-selecting out, uh, the lottery winners who received the treatment, and the lottery losers who didn't, who are our control group. And that should be fairly clear. Um, then we actually went out and provided the custom hire service, laser land leveling. That's one of ours, I believe. Um, we, actually, uh, Im we actually dragged them over from Western UP. We found a contractor there who did it for us. Um, we had exclusive use of four complete units, tractor and uh, tripods and, and the leveler itself, um, for 90 days. And that's the period when you do laser land leveling between the end of Rabi and the beginning of Kharif. There's about a 90-day interval you can work in. Um, we had a project team monitor to ensure compliance and no, and no side selling of the service to either our control farmers or others, um, and, we, and to gather data on, um, on various aspects of the study. Um, the lottery winners paid the operator of the uh, leveler a predetermined price. That was our draw price from the auction. It ranged from about 250 to 350 per hour, far below the market price, as was the purpose of, of our design. And IFPRI covered the additional costs to the uh, operator. Um, and there's some of the work in action. Um, we also did a, a costing of our service provider to get a sense of you know, what it took to provide these services, the, especially the variable costs. Um, and we, you know, we looked at the leveling costs, labor, fuel, and depreciation, transport, and setup costs as well. So I think I should turn over now, since uh, yeah, we'll keep it to about 25, 30 minutes, uh, to some of the analysis of our re and some of our results. So, so I'm gonna, th this, this presentation is a little bit different so, than, than presentations we often give on this project. Uh, here we're gonna give just a, just a snapshot uh, summary of a couple of the different analyses that we've done with these data. So, the, so David's gone over, we, you see where kind of the data is coming from, uh, the research design. So there's, there's four basic sets of, of <coughs> analyses that we've done with these data. So the first is, uh, is the kind of the pure RCT uh, impact evaluation. So I'll briefly talk about that. That's, that's actually pretty simple. Once we get to this point, it's very simple, right? So um, all the hard work here happens up front and then the, the analysis is very straightforward. So I'll briefly uh, summarize this. The, the second set of results has to do with, um, with what we can learn about demand and what farmer demand, farmer valuation of this technology uh, might mean for how you think about the diffusion of it, right? Especially private sector strategies. So as, as David said, um, one, of the, one of the unique kind of opportunities here was to interface directly through, through this, this uh, CISA initiative, an IFPRI initiative here in India, to interact directly with private sector providers and, and try to think about business models and delivery of, of new technology. So we'll talk about, I'll talk about some of these results where we can take those demand curves that we get out of the auction um, and, then, and then use the heterogeneity in that, in that demand to, to look at, to test basically different ways to, to, um, to target the delivery of the, of the technology. The third set has to do with networks and learning. Um, so we're very interested in knowing uh, how, how learning about this kind of technology, given that we're going into a blank slate. So this is, a, this is coming into an area where these uh, services didn't exist, uh, and then tracking it over two seasons. So there's sort of a learning season, and then, and then the second season in particular, we want to look between the two how farmers uh, learn and, and how social networks in particular facilitate learning. The last, the last set uh, I won't talk about it all uh, here. It's actually ongoing work where we use the results of the analysis to actually kind of extrapolate more to the landscape level and think about what this might mean for groundwater and groundwater interactions and spillovers between farmers. So we can talk a bit about that um, if, if you would like, uh, but that's ongoing and I won't, I won't really talk much about it. Okay, so the, Kind of the, the, the simplest RCT-based impacts are, are these. So this is um, broken into kind of two, two, two different big sets of results. So the, the first, on the left-hand side, are these expected first-order effects. 
Um, they come in two types, water pumped and diesel fuel consumed. Diesel fuel because this is all, uh, these are all diesel fueled pumps, water pumps. Uh, and there we find, these are percentages, so there we find 25% reduction in groundwater pumping, 25, an, 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 uh, a correlating 25% reduction in, uh, in diesel fuel consumption. And the rupee value here is about 400, so the rupee value per acre. So the value of that reduction, it's, that's the value of the reduction on the diesel side uh, because they don't pay for water, right? So they pay, they pay to pump it, but they don't pay for the water itself. So 400 rupees in this case, <coughs> that, that represents about, uh, so if, if you think of 400 rupees per acre, uh, it takes about three or four hours to level an acre. So the value of one year diesel fuel savings is, is essentially, it, it offsets uh, about a quarter of the, the, the um, I'm sorry, it offsets about 100 rupees uh, towards, the, towards the, the cost of the service, right? So, and then, and that leveling, I don't know if David mentioned, but the leveling is sort of a durable good, right? So it's, you level and, and it's, um, it's something you do every maybe four, five, six years, maybe seven years in some places. So that, those are the first order effects. Um, the second order effects are uh, harder to pick up because they're second order. Um, we, get the, we get directional effects on labor, right? But they're, they're not significant. These are the standard errors. So they're not significant, but they're, but they're pushing in that direction. And then crop yield, this, this technology is actually uh, a fairly nuanced technology for crop yield. Uh, so we don't pick up effects there. The, the key to this is, is, is really just uh, is the statistical power we had in the research design. Okay? So we, were, we, we designed it so we had the power to test these first order effects. Um, we're underpowered to test for these, these second order effects, but they're pushing in that direction. So what we're going to do though from here is really just sort of ignore these. Uh, take into account that, that farmers actually take these, I mean take into account that that farmers are sensitive to these and really just focus on these first order effects. So can yep. you explain, uh, so that's approximately 400 rupees per acre, that, that's a net reduction? That is, it's just on diesel fuel? That is, that's on diesel fuel. That's the, that's the value of the diesel fuel reduction. Right, so this is the, this is the, cost, this is the cost of the diesel fuel. Uh, that's, that's the value of this reduction in diesel fuel use. That's what that is. Yeah. Yes, that's for both, exactly. That's for the rice and the wheat combined. So this one, th this, which, so we're not showing a lot of, a lot of the other features. This is, this is from a regression uh, that spans both seasons, right? So, so we actually took, uh, we conducted an intra-seasonal survey that spanned both, both the rice and the wheat seasons, where we were, we were visiting these farmers mostly because we wanted to get really precise data on the input usage. I mean, the water usage in particular, this was our focus, right? So uh, we were worried about recall bias going back at the end of the year and asking. So we had, we had uh, frequent surveys going on throughout the survey. This aggregates all of those up uh, and then uses a bunch of other controls here, right? So fixed effects at village and district levels. Um, and then, and then just sort of uh, estimates this effect using, using uh, two-stage least squares, right? So basically what we're using is the, the lottery winners, uh, the, the, the lottery, a lottery win becomes the instrument for, uh, for receiving the laser, laser line leveling services. Yeah, did you? Yeah, yeah. the question on the water pump, what exactly is the question you're asking? Like how many liters or how long have you been pumping? It's, it's how long. So what we, yeah, so what we do is we, um, we asked them how long they ran the pump, which is something that they know quite well because uh, every minute it's running is, is diesel fuel that they're paying for, right? So they, they actually watch quite closely how long they run the pump. And as David suggested, you know, they, they're basically watching to see that it's sufficiently flooded, right? So, um, so it, it, if it has to climb up to a higher point, then they let it run, run, run. Now, that's not good enough. I mean, that's not enough to know just how long they run the pump. What you need to know also is the diameter of the, of the pump and the horsepower of it, right? So there's actually an engineering equation that tells us exactly how much water was pumped, or at least it allows us to, to estimate the, the amount of water pumped given the duration. 
the diameter and the horsepower. Now, ground, the, ground, the groundwater is actually at, at pretty equal depths here. There's not a lot of variation in the, in the, in the water table. So, I mean, so, so anyway, that's, that's the way we get the water. Now, um, if you're interested in measuring these things, I mean, one thing we, we could have done now that we could do now that we couldn't have done then. Uh, so I have colleagues at Berkeley. Um, so I'm, I'm part of the Sega group at Berkeley. And they have access to a censoring. They have folks who have designed um, feature phones to relay uh, water, uh, something like this. So you'd put the sensor in the pump. You'd attach a feature phone. And it would, it would wake up and send data and shut down. And so one battery can last the season. And you could, you could actually, you could get much more precise data by monitoring directly. But we were doing it sort of in an old-fashioned way. Yeah. You already had a copy phone, right? Yeah, that's right. It wasn't totally old-fashioned, but yeah. Yeah. We have lasers in there. Come on. Yeah. Um, OK, so that's the. That's now the demand. That's the basic impact um, to farmers. The demand side. So what we what we do here is is think about different sort of simulate using the demand curves that we that we observe. We want to simulate different uh, segmentation strategies. Let me just let me just skip ahead to this first. So this one, this is these are the demand curves for these two years. So we actually did that auction first in 2011, and then in 2012. Now for all of the segmentation stuff we're doing. It's using this blue, the blue one, the 2000, uh, or 2000, yeah, 2012 demand curve. Um, a couple of things that are important about the tech. So this is a technology that does, a, it, it provides a very familiar service because everyone who, every farmer who flood irrigates knows how important it is to have level plots. So it provides a very familiar service and it just does it more precisely than, they than what they've been able to do before. So every indication we have is that uh, with the information we provided, the fact that they saw this demonstration effect year one, that by the time we get to here in, in year two, this demand curve, I think, has, has converged somewhere. It's at least close to what the long run demand curve is going to be. So that's what we're going to take um, as the basis for these simulations. Okay, so now let me go back here. So what we're going to do, we're going to consider three different types of, of targeting strategies. And they both, they all correspond to what you would have seen in, in kind of introduction microeconomics. So the first is uh, a first degree price discrimination um, model, which is admittedly unrealistic, but it gives us a benchmark. And that's, that's just perfect, perfect targeting. So what we get from the auction is a reservation price for each farmer for the value of the service. So we can just kind of march down the demand curve and target perfectly uh, the way you would in first degree price discrimination. The second set, this is the biggest set, is uh, a set of third degree price discrimination uh, strategies. So these are, third degree is where you're, you're targeting on some observable characteristic. Okay? Uh, and so we're doing that on three. So first by district. So we're, there actually were demand differences, statistically important di demand differences by district. So we're going to target by district land holdings, so total amount of land held by farmers. Um, and poverty status, that's whether they, whether they hold, hold the, a BPL card. Okay. So this is third degree price discrimination. And then the last one is a second, it's, it's akin to a second degree price discrimination. Uh, second, second degree price discrimination is where you, 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 you sort of charge a price in a way that implicitly uh, sorts consumers, right? That allows them to kind of sort themselves. So this one, what we're, what we're gonna do is a first hour discount. So if you offer a first hour discount, the effective price is much lower for a small farmer than a large farmer. And, and that actually turns out uh, to, to foreshadow the results. So that turns out to, to, to actually march down the demand curves and leverage the differences in demand quite effectively. So, so then what we do with each of these strategies is um, we, we, you have to start with basically a budget. Like what is the, what's sort of this, what's the subsidy budget or the targeting budget you're going to use? to then, to then uh, implement these strategies. We take this, the existing subsidy levels uh, for, the, for the machinery. So most of the subsidies in India are at the machinery level. But you can back out of that what effectively what that, what that represents at the, at, at the hour uh, level, so an, a per hour subsidy. And then all of these things, we can, we can sort of calibrate them in the simulation so they're cost comparable. So they're all basically spending the same subsidy budget. So we're taking as given India's proclivity to give subsidies on everything. 
and then, and, and then take that amount and then say, you know, are there better ways to give subsidies if the goal is to, to, to diffuse the technology? Um, and then we're gonna, we're gonna evaluate them along different measures. So, the, so the, the cost of adding an additional acre, the cost of adding an additional household, or the, from the perspective of the service provider, kind of how, how sustainable it is. Okay, so here's the, here's the punchline result without going through all the other details. So this is how these, these different strategies stack up. Okay, so to understand this, this is the subsidy cost per water saved. So if the, if the objective is about groundwater, uh, reducing groundwater extraction, this might be a metric of, of, of interest. This is the subsidy cost per farmer leveling. So if instead this was thought of as sort of a poverty, um, a reduction in, uh, or a poverty program to reduce, reduce input costs for farmers, this might be the metric of interest. And then in the space, then we have these, the first hour discount, perfect, this is the first order uh, price discrimination, first degree, perfect uniform BPL land holdings and the, and the district. Uniform is just sort of applying a uniform subsidy. And then the size of the bubbles is, is, the, is essentially capturing the, the perspective of the service provider. So the blue ones represent net losses, right? So these are ones that when you take into account all the costs, the cost of delivering to the new plot, setting up, so this has a lot to do with the size of the plot and the number of plots they're leveling. Those two actually are, are, are losers from the perspective of the provider. Uh, but everything else actually is, you know, there's a net gain in there. Um, and this first hour discount actually turns out, so what you want basically is, you want one that's closest to this, this origin. Uh, and with, with at least um, some small white bubble. So that's, that, so in the, in the paper, this paper, we end up focusing a lot on the first hour discount. Um, let me, s we can talk about these um, <coughs> maybe in discussion if there's interest. Let me just jump to the, to these other sets. So the other, the next set of results that I'll, that I'll mention, the last one here is the network based learning and valuation. So what we, one piece that we, uh, we included in the survey was a, was a network mod module where um, we had photos of all the farmers in our sample. And as part of the, part of the, the elicitation, we would hand this kind of a sheet to, to the farmer. These are all the farmers in the sample in his or her village. And then they, we just went through and asked them, which of these farmers do you talk to on a regular basis? And then they would, they would point and the enumerator would enter these numbers. Right? So, um, and then a series of other more detailed questions about those, those conversations. So we actually can estimate something about social networks within our sample, right? So we have complete networks within sample that we use then uh, along with the lottery to estimate uh, how information flows through these networks, right? So the lottery is important here because once we know the networks and we know who was treated and that treatment is exogenous, then we, we essentially are injecting information into social networks that we can track, um, we can track and the way we track it is using the willingness to pay. So this is really the key. The key part here is that we have uh, a, a first auction and then a, sac a second auction. So sort of baseline and endline auctions. And we look in the, the change in their willingness to pay between those two periods as a function of their networks and how many of the farmers were treated in their networks. So that's essentially what we do. Um, okay, so let me just, some bullet point summary, um, uh, summaries of the result. So we find that, that the network, those network effects really are uh, potent in this case, so that it increases, if you have one adopter uh, in your network, uh, it increases your willingness to pay by 25%. That is between the, the baseline and the end line, your valuation goes up by 24%. Um, and evidence suggests we can actually look in detail at where that's coming from, and the evidence we get um, by, by looking at how they interact with these farmers is that it really is, it really is learning rather than mimicry. Right? They're not just sort of copying farmers that they respect, uh, the behavior of farmers. They're actually visiting fields, they're, they're looking, and then you can actually look sort of heterogeneously at look at, at the, that response by, by irrigation, by how much they're irrigating. And those who irrigate a lot tend to learn, uh, tend to value more. The jump in, learn, uh, jump in, in, their, in their willingness to pay is higher. So it's, there's at least evidence that it's due to learning and not mimicry. This I should mention, if, this is more of a methodological point, but it's an important one because social network, social learning is a, is a really popular area of inquiry in applied microeconomics. 
the, the one thing, this, this is really an advantage that we have because we were able to look at willingness to pay or valuation-based learning rather than adoption-based learning. That's important because adoption is a, is, a, is a binary variable that's reflecting, usually reflecting a latent variable, which is their valuation, right? And if their valuation's above a threshold, then they adopt. That's the way we usually think about these kinds of models. Uh, we actually have the latent variable, or at least a measure of it. We have their valuation, which means that we can do that as a, we can look at the continuous variable response to, to, social, uh, to social networks. And actually we can show, you can do sort of the opposite, the counterfactual where if we had just seen a adoption, we would see actually only a little bit of, of, of learning going on. But because we get this continuous variable, we can, we can uh, pin more precisely, pin down more precisely those estimates. Uh, we have another paper that's going on that I won't mention other than this bullet, uh, which is parsing out differences between uh, female and male networks. Um, uh, and that actually turns out to be important because the structure of those networks and their effect is quite different. Uh, and in some ways complementary. They're actually talking to different people, getting different information, and having different effects on, on household valuation. Uh, let me skip that. Let me get to, so let me just wrap up with, with these kind of final thoughts. Yep. Those slides with that yep. Did some of those um, women go to that, to that no, they did. So yeah, so they didn't. So these, if where there are women, these are female farmers, uh, female heads of household farmers. Yep. So what we did, do, what we had to do, is actually go back and elicit. So for you know, for his wife, we had to go back and elicit networks for his wife. Yeah. But this is. Um, did I get that right, Kajal? Kajal was the one on the front lines of all this. Uh, all right, so some final thoughts to summarize, um, summarize on the methodology, just to point out a couple things that David mentioned that I think are worth mentioning here, especially given that it's, it's a 3IE event. Um, there's a couple of features that I think are worth noting. The, the, the first is, is this blank slate that we were working with. So it was, it was a unique opportunity working with CISA and IFPRI to go into a place uh, where a market for custom hire services didn't exist. And, and, and seed the market and watch it over the, over the, over the first year. And, and actually, we've been able to track it a little bit further. But, but watch it in those early days and see how farm evaluation, how the benefits, how the social learning is kind of affecting the diffusion. Okay? Now, there's more work to do because we are only looking at the beginning. But that, I think, is actually a, that, that's, that's a nice opportunity. The other thing that was really, um, that I think is a, a nice feature of the design is leading into the randomized control trial with the auction, right? So the auction was the mechanism that gives, that's what gets us this incentive compatible valuation. Uh, that allows us to track a lot, know a lot more about how farmers are thinking about it and how they're learning. Um, but then it also sets up, it has an added benefit of setting up um, a degree of balance in the RCT that specifically relates to our research question. So we were interested in market segmentation techniques, basically, well, strategies for targeting. But that's especially relevant for farmers who are sort of near market prices, those who you, you might be able to target effectively. So the, the auction allows us to, to, to go into a random sample and select a group that is balanced in that degree. They're balanced in the sense that they're all kind of near that market price. And then look at, look at the, the randomized control trial effects for that group. Uh, so the result, as I said, we find that water pump decreased, um, decreased by 25%. Diesel fuel savings about 400 rupees per acre per year. And that, as I was, I was getting at before, that, that implies a payback period of three to five years um, based just on the diesel fuel savings. Now that doesn't take into account these second order effects that I think farmers do actually realize and appreciate. It's just that we didn't have the power to, 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 um, to pull them out. Uh, okay, so now as an epilogue, since, since we left in 2012, uh, there's actually been quite a bit of encouraging development in this place. So, so without, without our invention, or without our intervention, 40 new service providers um, came into these districts, into this area. They've, they've since, since we left, have serviced 400 farmers and leveled about 1,500 acres. Um, so this is, this is all sort of organic private sector, custom hire services uh, developing in this, in this market. Um, 
lastly, so to end on kind of big picture, um, this kind of work I think is really timely for India. Uh, because when you look around and you listen to people who know something about Indian agriculture, India really is on the cusp of, of, of a wave of mechanization that, that, uh, that has not been seen before. Uh, that has partly to do with labor, labor markets and wage rates. So uh, Narega has had an impact on wages that has triggered a lot of this mechanization. So on the margin, that's actually brought a lot of new, a lot of new demand in for mechanized services. Um, and there's a real, I think there's a really unique opportunity to learn both about the impacts of those markets on, uh, the impacts of the mechanization on farmers, but also kind of market level effects on labor and, 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 um, and, and prices. Um, interactions I mentioned in Riga. Um, yeah, and the, the final thing I'll mention, so one of the things we're, we're just starting up, I'll just, um, just a plug for a big project that Kajal's now working on, which is similar, this is sort of version two of this work on mechanical rice transplanters in Bihar, which is different in some ways. The key difference is that, and I think this is where we, we have an opportunity to learn in this regard, the key difference is mechanical rice transplanters displace female workers, transplanters, uh, and so it's likely to have a much bigger effect on local labor markets than the land leveling. Uh, so an opportunity to kind of see, see this mechanization kind of spread in real time and understand its impacts, the structure, and what we might, uh, what we might think of, of potential policy interventions. <laughs>